A warm welcome to today's talk, Thursday the 29th of September. Now I'm going to be looking at some data from the UK today on COVID, mostly BA5. This is going to apply really pretty well wherever you are because BA5 is still the predominant variant. Now I'm going to start with a really interesting graphic. Now this graphic here differentiates between people that have uh, respi upper respiratory infections, basically common colds, and what has caused that common cold. Now here we see, this is the proportion here, where their common cold symptoms are caused by COVID. So let's be quite clear, this is now a COVID cold in these cases, upper respiratory symptoms, that we'll look at in a little detail in a minute. So... Um, that's the blue line there, the COVID colds. And this orange line is the colds caused by all other viruses. Now, a few of these will be the other coronaviruses, but most of them are what we call rhinoviruses that cause rhinitis, inflammation of the nose. This is not yet, I'm pleased to say, influenza. So people often mix up the terms cold and flu. They're completely different. Flu is short for influenza. Common cold is, is a rhinitis. And of course, colds usually aren't serious at all, pretty horrible and inconvenient, um, but not uh, dangerous like flu can be. But of course, COVID is even more dangerous than influenza, as we know. So we see that if you've got a cold at the moment, um, it's four times, it's, there's a difference there of about four times. So you're four times more likely to be caused by a non COVID, uh, a non COVID virus, but still a substantial amount caused by uh, the COVID virus. Now, this has come from the, uh, the Zoe Health Study data, which Professor Spector has kindly asked me to present again uh, today. So we'll do that now, and then we'll be critiquing that as we compare it with other sources of data. Now, uh, new symptomatic cases in the UK, it's still pretty high, 184,000 new symptomatic cases. So that's the incidence, the number of new cases. The people currently with the infection, 2.1 million, that is the prevalence. And according to the Zoe data, that gives us one in 31 people currently uh, symptomatic in the United Kingdom. So that's the Zoe estimate of that. And here's the graphic. This is pretty interesting. We've followed this, of course, in some detail. And uh, we are seeing uh, a, an increase in cases as of late. So this is definitely going up. Uh, it's just still the end of September and we can expect to see some increases in that, we would imagine. Um, how important that is, we'll be uh, discussing. Now, I want to show you some more COVID data from the Zoe study, first of all. So that shows that if you've got cold, it's four times more likely to be caused by a rhinovirus than a coronavirus or a SARS coronavirus to virus, to be more precise. Here's new daily cases of uh, infectious infected COVID in the UK based on the people that had positive symptoms and tested positive. So uh, again, very thorough data and we definitely see this increase, don't we? So the increase has started earlier than we had uh, thought. We said this last week and it's carried on. Um, it's, it's carried on increasing earlier in the season than I would have thought anyway. New daily cases in England, a similar trend going up. These are the uh, Omicron spikes, of course, that we see here. Um, this is the uh, this is Scotland. So Scotland's actually flattened out a little bit there. Uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, though, I think are going up. Now, this is the English uh, region. So this is like the north and east and west of England and everywhere. Now, OK, we, we could argue about it that London's a little bit lower there. But there again, London was a little bit higher here. So this could mean actually that people generated more immunity here from infection uh, and therefore there's less cases there. But that's probably straining a bit much out the tea bag. Basically, there's just variations in the data. But we see that the English regions and the uh, regions are trending together, um, which is, is the main point of that graphic, really. Now, daily incidents across the age group. Now, this is significant. Now, we see an increase in the younger age group here, particularly a sort of 7 to 11 year olds, although this data doesn't show that. So they've definitely got an increase in um, symptomatic cases. Now, of course, this is because um, kids are back to school. They're, they're socialising indoors more. The, the, the weather's already not as good uh, in the UK. 
Um, so, but mostly going back to school, children, uh, young people socialising. So that's gone up. And then the second line that's going up there is the green line, which is the 35 to 54 year olds, which of course is the age of these children's parents. So as often happens, children pick it up at school in play activities of youth and then take it back to uh, their parents. But significant to notice on this graphic as well, we do have an increase in the 55 to 74s and also in the over 75s, which is that purple line. So a lower increase, but it's still uh, an increase in cases. And these are the people that are most vulnerable to getting poorly, of course. And that is reflected in some increase in hospitalizations in the UK. Now, um, these are long COVID cases. Now, th this is the, uh, the projection of, given that the number of people who have the infection today, how many are likely to go on to develop long COVID? And it looks like these numbers are quite bad. But I was actually talking to the uh, Zoe data scientist today. We had a video talk today. And um, this graphic here is actually based on extrapolations from 2021 which was, of course, uh, when there was things like Delta, which is associated with, we believe, more long COVID. So really, this graphic is um, very pessimistic. The actual numbers are probably quite a bit less than this. And, and uh, of course, I mean, the, the, the data scientists are very aware of this and they know the need to update this from more modern uh, data. So... Um, Yes, lots of people getting COVID now. Some of those are going to go and get long COVID, unfortunately. Uh, but now in Omicron times, we believe that's less than this uh, higher figure, which is a prediction on current data, but based on previous prevalence or, or the, the likelihood of long COVID occurring after infection in 2021. So they're very aware of that, obviously. And that makes sense. So if, if we put that on as a worst case scenario, I think we could reasonably say that at the moment. Now, we always want to know how valid our data is because in, on this channel, we want to present data and evidence as much as we can. Don't always get it right. At least I don't always get it right. But if, if we get it wrong, we come back and apologize. We get it right as much as we can. And it's certainly as honest as I can make it. Uh, so it's good to analyze the, uh, the validity of the uh, Zoe data as well. Now, th th this, this, is the, um, this is the Zoe study data here in pink you can probably see this is modeled ons data that's their uh, prediction so it's accurate they are predicting an increase so interesting that the ons is predicting an increase and of course zoe has already uh, seen that uh, increase there um, so it's kind of ahead of the times but if we look at the ons data compared to the zoe data we see that um, it's basically pretty accurate it's following roughly the same data points these trends here except um, here where ONS was showing more cases than uh, more cases than Zoe no obvious explanation for this but most of the data is is pretty consistent and this is the Imperial uh, Imperial College London react react one data react one you might remember was the study looking at the uh, prevalence of the antigens and again we see that they are all consistent so we've got the collaboration from the react study and essentially collaboration from the um essentially collaboration from the um office for national statistics data now um let's go on i've shown you that increase in prevalence there now just to plug uh, the big diet study uh people are being emailed this now now i've had lots of uh, communications from the states I'm afraid at the moment all of the Zoe um, health study um, facilities aren't yet available in the States. I believe that's being worked on. But in the UK, people are being emailed now and next week for the big diet study. So this is looking at uh, food questionnaires. The, um, the blood pressure study, blood pressure is so important. They got 50,000 responses. This is real good quality big data. It's not replacing randomized double blind controlled trials, but it's giving independent, transparent data, which we could argue about uh, current uh, the current round of randomized controlled trials but this is a different way of collecting data and it's it's equally valid because it's such large numbers so look out for the big diet study fill that in and that's going to lead on to the um to the intermittent fasting study does intermittent fasting actually work so we should have definitive answers for this by the end of the year and um 
I could lose, do with losing five, ten, ten maybe kilograms. Um, so if that works, that's an interesting possibility for me and um, probably even for some of you watching. Now, Office for National Statistics, latest data here, quite a bit uh, behind the times, really, only up to the 14th of September. Now, these are the estimated uh, percentage of the population testing positive for coronavirus, but this is based on nose and throat swabs. So this is based on definitive PCR data. And uh, that's giving uh, one in 70 people in England, but of course this was a couple of weeks ago now, uh, the prevalence, we know that will go higher. Uh, Wales one in 75, Northern Ireland one in 80, uh, Scotland one in 55. So lower prevalence than the, the Zoe, probably because um, a larger, per I put here probably because a larger percentage of cases are asymptomatic. So remember the Zoe data is picking up on symptomatic cases. And the Office of National Statistics is, is, is picking up on all cases, all infections. So the fact that the amount of infections diagnosed is higher than the number of symptomatic cases could indicate we're getting more and more asymptomatic infections, which is good news. Because you get asymptomatic infections, that's going to boost your natural immunity. Uh, and you never know it's been boosted because you didn't have symptoms. And also, but of course, the ONS data is behind the times, so that will be up next week. Now, last week I was very um, um, assertively predicted uh, that the Office of National Statistics data would start to show an increase. Uh, last week it wasn't. Here's the data for uh, England. And now we see that it is just starting to show an upturn here. And this will be higher next week. We know that from the Zoe data. So we were correct about uh, this data point here last week, and I'm sure we'll be correct about that one. Likewise, in Wales, uh, we were correct uh, about predicting this data point here. Uh, we were predicted that accurately. Now, um, the England and Welsh data is clear on this. The Scottish and the um, Northern Ireland data, uh, less so. Um, and we looked at the Scottish data flattening out, but, but of course the population in England is much higher, so that gives, means we were completely correct about the UK, uh, the UK data. So they will be higher with the Office for National Statistics survey next week. And we really are blessed with the amount of data we've got in the UK, really. Now, a percentage of patients in acute uh, hospitals uh, with confirmed COVID-19 who are being treated primarily, in other words, who's being admitted for COVID and who's been admitted uh, with COVID right, as a coincidental finding. Now, um, what we're finding now is the people admitted with COVID uh, are actually uh, uh, outnumbering those that are admitted for COVID. And we'll look at the data that uh, supports that now. This is the graphic from the Office for National Statistics. And this is the English regions, 18th of June uh, 21 to pretty pretty long time um so that's uh june that's 14 months worth of data isn't it here now what, what we see is um th th this time period here so um th 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 this is uh june 21 june september january so what we see is about here about there uh it was so there it was about 75 percent of patients were in hospital who were testing positive in hospital were in because they had COVID, for COVID. So this is the for COVID era. Patients admitted because they had COVID. Incidental findings, less. But then that went down quite dramatically. And now that figure there is just under 40%. So it's about 39% there. So now 39% of people in hospital are admitted because they have COVID, for COVID. All the rest, all these are incidentals. They're there for another reason. So this is good, indicating ongoing reducing severity. And of course, it won't escape your notice that this is the Omicron period from here onwards. So this was the end of the Delta. This is the start of the Omicron period. And we see a great reduction in the people hospitalized for COVID. And it carries on going down as immunity in the population increases to this virus which is no longer a novel virus um now um just briefly briefly i just wanted to mention 
long COVID, still a problem. We've done, we've done, looked at this this week. We looked at neurological complications and Alzheimer's disease after COVID. Um, so the UK at the moment, 3.1% of the population are complaining of uh, protracted uh, symptoms after COVID. 83% of those 2 million, 12 weeks at least, 45% of those 2 million complaining of symptoms for a year, 25, 22% of that 2 million for two years. Main symptoms being fatigue, shortness of breath, difficulty concentrating and muscle aches. So again, th this one is mostly the neurological one. Well, that could be the neurological or the respiratory one. That's the mostly the respiratory one. That's more the neurological form and that's the sort of more systemic form of long COVID. And uh, symptoms ad adversely affecting the day-to-day -day activities in 73% of those with long COVID. So this is still a major uh, concern and we are especially we're seeing the data with the long-term neurological features and um, how many of these will recover at the moment is 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 unclear and then just to finish um there we go uh, last seven this is official uk government data so cases up 42 percent means very little it just means we're testing a bit more uh, but that but that means more people are going for testing so that there is a genuine increase in cases consistent with the ons data consistent with the zoe data so we've got um three forms of data essentially uh, collaborating each other here in the uk which of course is very reassuring truth can be found by multiple collaborations not always true but seem to fit there uh, deaths down 2.3% 339 in the week Patients admitted um, up quite a bit, but on a relatively low number, uh, 5,930 in the week. But if only 39% of those are admitted for COVID, that means 2,312 admitted primarily for COVID. So good to see that the severity is going down as a combination of the Omicron BA5 and the other new Omicron type variants that are coming along and as a consequence of the increased immunity uh, in the population. So there we go. I believe what we can say, <clears throat> it's looking like that we're going to see increasing cases of lesser consequence. Not true for everyone, but the trend is lots of cases over the next few months um, less uh, a very very much smaller percentage of severe cases and omicron um, or whatever virus comes after omicron that the sars coronavirus too hopefully in a few years time will be just another one of these irritating common cold coronaviruses that is the hope it's not going away it will be endemic for a while but hey lots of viruses are endemic uh, as you know, if you've got a cold at the moment, which is quite a lot of us. Okay, there we are. Um, leave that for today and thank you for watching.